This program is brought to you by Dolku Media. Fixing South Sudan, ideas for the new nation. With award-winning journalist Mading Mor. Absolutely. Honorable Ashwin, as you can see, the ideas of the initiatives are varied. The July uh, on July 8th, uh, the clashes in J1 took place, which was very unfortunate. Including uh, country-specific ones, uh, which uh, the rebellion con continue to be. Fixing Ideas for the new nation. Hello and welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Madengor. This week, a look at the work of the United Nations mission in the Republic of South Sudan as its mandate expires in December. Six years into the formation of ANMIS, will the UN exit the country or will its mandate be renewed? For another year. Is UNMIS mandate a good idea for fixing South Sudan? Joining us for the interview is the special representative of the UN Secretary General and the head of UNMIS, His Excellency David Scher. It gives me a lot of joy to welcome you on Fixing South Sudan. How are you? Thank you very much, Bede. Very nice to be with, with you today. Good to have you in the show. Yes. So, we are talking about your mandate, and the mandate has gone through extreme change, fluctuations from a capacity building mission at the inception to something else. Uh, what, what is the mandate as it stands? Well, the mandate is really about two key issues. It's around um, building durable peace and supporting the peace efforts, and it's about protecting civilians, so making sure that the people on the ground uh, get the humanitarian assistance, we look at human rights, we, and we support them. Many of them are, are, are displaced, as you know, and they're in different parts across the country. So those are the two parts, building peace, protecting civilians. And as you say, it's changed over the time as a result of the conflict. So it really is a reflection of where South Sudan is now, uh, but not necessarily where we'd like it to be in the future. We'd like it to go back to the, uh, the capacity building of the, of the days gone by. And answer our question, is this mandate a good idea for fixing South Sudan? Well, it's a, it's a mandate that is, is born out of necessity. It's born out of what's on the ground at the moment. Um, and so it's helping to protect people, make sure that people have enough to eat, they have their homes protected, we're looking after their human rights. At the same time, we're looking at the peace agreement and how the peace agreement can be taken forward and peace come to South Sudan. So we're in support of that. Now, if peace is, uh, is achievable in South Sudan, and I seriously hope it, it is, obviously that's my biggest hope, then I think many of the, uh, then what we will see is a change in the mandate. Um, and the change in the mandate will be about development and about capacity and about taking South Sudan forward like every other country in the world. You have been on the ground for just less than a year, 10 months to be precise, and what do you think is the impact of UNMIS in the shortest time that you have stayed here? Is it making a difference in South Sudan? I really do think it is. Um, my feeling is that if we, that us being here has a, a very profound impact on people. It has so, undoubtedly saved the lives of thousands of people. Uh, I have no doubt about that in the places that we are, we are, we are positioned. It's ensured that we have been able to, there's been able to have the, the food and the, and the assistance that people need in order to be able to, to continue their lives. Um, and, it, and I do believe it's created a, a sense of stability. So right at the moment, for example, we, we are looking at the way that we are constructing roads across South Sudan so that the roads are able to be passable. We have five engineering teams uh, on the ground, military engineering teams that are building roads. We're patrolling roads so that people can move more safely up and down uh, the major roads from Nimale to Juba, from Juba to Boer, from Juba eventually up to, to Wau in the, coming, in the coming weeks. 
all of those things, and these are just a fraction of what we do, are helping to contribute to a better South Sudan so that it can get on its own two feet and, and, and move forward. The mandate is currently under review. Uh, the mandate expires in December, and you have a process you call a strategic review That's right, of the yeah. mandate. What is it? Well, the mandate, every, the mandate in South Sudan is, is only 12 months long, and every, every year it needs to be renewed. My contract here is only 12 months at a time. Um, and the reason for that is it's, it, we hope that the, the current structure of UNMIS as it stands at the moment is only temporary, that we can move on into a, into a completely different realm of more developmental and, and, and more capacity building uh, type of a mandate. So it comes up every 12 months. Um, the, the mandate is set by the Security Council. It's not set by us. Uh, we don't have... We have an input into it, but ultimately it's the, it's the decision of 15 members of the Security Council that, that make that decision. However, what, we've, what we are doing over the next few weeks is to have, is to have a, what we call a strategic review that comes through. It looks at what we're doing, it looks at the security situation on the ground, it looks at how things have changed from the, from the year before, um, and it writes its review and it's submitted through the Secretary General to the uh, Security Council. Now, the Security Council looks at that. It might completely reject our, uh, our, our assessment, uh, but it generally what it does is it looks at it and says, OK, it, we may we need to change things around a bit, and uh, it goes on from there. So there is a team coming here? Yes, that's right. There's about and 10 who is going to be consulted? 10 or 12 people on the team from a variety of different parts of the agency. The person who's heading it is from outside the UN. They wanted somebody who was independent from the UN can, that can be more, um, perhaps be a bit more objective. And it will be meeting with members of the, of the government, certainly the president, uh, members of the of, uh, ministers. It will travel into, to two or three different parts of the, of the country. To meet non-state non actors. Absolutely. It'll Why be, is that important? Well, because it wants to get a, a you know a, a, a the widest variety of views that it possibly can. Um, it will also uh, travel to after it finishes here. It'll be here for about five or six days. It will then travel to Addis. It'll meet with some of the the uh, South Sudanese and not inside of um, inside of South Sudan to get their views as well. It wants to build a big uh, as wide a picture as it possibly can. How much role does government uh, play at this stage of review? Um, it'll play a, a, a pretty substantial role, frankly, because obviously the government's a you know, hugely important player. Um, so they will be able to, uh, they will have their, their views listened to. They'll be, they'll, be, you know, they'll be asking questions of us and our review team will be asking questions of them. They'll be asking whether UNMIS is the right shape and form for the, the current situation. I mean, uh, what it would like to see us do more uh, what it, maybe you'd like to see us do less. I mean, it depends very much on what the, the government decides it wants to say to it. So, I, you know, I, I think it's going to be a you know, fairly frank and open discussion. That's what I would hope that would happen. Um, and then it'll bundle up that and then submit its report to the Security Council. Is there ever any review of SOFA? This was a document that was signed at the initial stage and uh, governs uh, your operations your relationship with the government, and there have been a lot of challenges uh, uh, with regard to SOFA. Uh, there have been uh, uh, constraints uh, in your movements. Uh, do you think this will also come up? Uh, I think it will. Um, the State of Forces Agreement, or, or SOFA, is something, as you say, was negotiated right at the very beginning. It the SOFA agreements generally follow a, a, a very common type of um, agreement that's quite common across many peacekeeping operations. So it's not just, it's not unique uh, in the sense, it's unique to South Sudan, but it's, it, the, the main principles are incorporated in every SOFA agreement. So there might be um, some issues that come up around that. Uh, some of the issues that we're facing in terms of our ability to move freely is something that we will probably bring up with both the strategic assessment and uh, the government as well. They might be asking how the SOFA is working. I don't think 
my own impression is I don't think there'll be major changes to the State of Forces Agreement because, as I say, it is quite common acro in, in, in across the world and in, in different places the UN works. Is it sensible to argue that your forces should move without any, uh, with, with, with unhindered? Is that because there, there are sovereignty issues that people talk about here? And if the UN patrols are just given that uh, unhindered access, then it feels like there's no government in town. Is that uh, the way you look at it? Um, this is always, the, this is the balance that we, where we have to have. On the one hand, um, the UN forces should be able to move unhindered, but at the same time we recognise that, you know, that it, it, this is a sovereign country and we don't, we don't do that um, without understanding and recognising the sovereignty of a country. So it's not like we just wake up in the morning and decide we just want to go here, there or everywhere. We do that in conjunction and collaboration with the with, with the authorities in South Sudan. And actually, it's, it's the, that's the, the authorities primarily within the government, but if we're going into some areas, we'll, we'll need the, um, the acceptance of uh, some of the opposition groups as well. Is this team coming from New York? Is it an independent team? And what are you going to tell them? What is your own assessment? Um, well, it is a, the, the leader of the team is somebody who's from outside of the UN. They, that this person, Kevin Kennedy, who's leading it, uh, was um, uh, in the UN before, but now he's outside. So he's got he's retired from the UN. He's got nothing to prove. Um, he'll be looking at it at this with a fresh eyes. Um, my what I will be telling them from perhaps from last year will be the the situation has changed in, in South Sudan, particularly in Juba. When they the mandate was formulated last year, it was heavily influenced by the fighting that occurred in July 2016. Uh, the situation in Juba is different from what it was back then. Um, that it's more, Juba is more stable, um, there's no doubt about that. However, um, the equatorial regions which were r largely peaceful before Jan uh, July last year um, are now in, in conflict. So uh, we want to be able to increase our presence in the Equatoria regions. This is the area where uh, we have a mil more than a million people have left and, and, and gone largely to a Uganda, some, some to the Republic of Congo, but uh, main, mainly to Uganda. And we want to be able to look at how we can help stabilise that area of the country, pr um, encourage people to stay in their homes, and at the same time encourage people to come back from Uganda and into that area. So that, if I was looking at the big changes that have happened since July last year, that would be, and the mandate last year, that, that would be the, the main changes. And in your attempt to uh, assist the populations in South Sudan, you have come under intense criticism of even systematic failure, failure to protect civilians, failure to achieve some of the other things that are in your mandate and there was uh, uh, investigations and it found that your forces did not act when they were supposed to. It, what do you make of, of, that, of that accusation? Um, look, I think we, we, we uh, uh, it, I, I accept the fact that we, we, could, have done, we could have done better. I don't, I don't accept the fact that we didn't uh, protect people. And I look, when I look in South Sudan, and for example, we are just behind us here. We've got thirty-nine thousand people in a, in a camp right beside the, where we are, where we're sitting right here. And I think uh, around about twenty people died in, during the fighting last year. Um, now that was regrettable, but most of those people died not because they were attacked. It was just they died because of random bullets and whatever that were flying around, collateral damage, if you like. So the fact that we were here and those people were here and they were, you know overwhelmingly safe speaks to our presence here and what we can do. So a lot, sometimes we look at the glass being half empty rather than half full. But it was However, I mean, I, look, I, I, I accept that we, we, we need to be, uh, you know, we, we, we've got some improvements made and as you say, we had a board of investigation that came out. We've made a lot of changes since then. Our force now is uh, under, certainly under my leadership, I've, I've wanted it to be more robust. I want it to be more nimble and flexible and I want it to be proactive rather than reacting to a situation. I want it to be there in front of the problem rather than, rather than behind the problem. And that's what we've been trying to look at more 
as a result of uh, over the last few months. This shortcoming was not only seen in the last violence, which was July 2016, but also dating back to 2013 in a Kobo, civilians were killed at the UN camps in Malakal, in Bor, in Bentiu, and you talked about the Jubowan. So it is widespread. And the question that some people ask is, how can armies ask for such sweep mandate when it is unable to discharge it and even protect civilians, which is its primary responsibility? We have 220,000 people living in our camps at the moment, and the reason they're there is because they feel protected. Now, I wake up in the morning um, knowing that what we, our presence here is, is ensuring that those people um, at least are there and they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're safe. Now, have we had problems in the past? Yes. Uh, no doubt about that, but we're a peacekeeping operation. We're not a war fighting uh, contingent here. We nobody asks, the contingents that come here don't come here to, to, to fight in a war. They come here to keep, keep the peace and to, and to protect people as best they possibly can. And as I say, uh, we've been doing a lot more patrolling, being a lot more robust on the ground. There's many occasions where um, we have come up against armed groups uh, where and sometimes there's been firing. Very, very often in the last few months there's been cocking of weapons in a standoff, and our people have stood, at, stood their ground and, uh, and have, in, in the case of a number of, two or three cases I can, I can recall recently, where young boys have been, were, were going to be forcibly recruited into armed groups, we've got those boys back and returned them to their families. Now, you know, that's happened on a number of occasions. I, Actually, I'm very proud of the, our, our forces. Um, you, have list, you have listened and you made adjustments. There is something called a regional protection force in place. Is that a response to that criticism? The re regional protection force was mandated by, uh, by, the, by the, uh, the Security Council, 4,000 strong. Uh, that was supposed to, to, to reinforce the presence in Juba. It was, it was, it was uh, mandated at a time, as I say, was heavily influenced by what had happened in July and, the, and, the, and the, certainly the, the Security Council felt that needed to have more forces here in Juba. Our feeling now, um, given what's gone on, is that Juba is more stable than it, than it was. We certainly still need forces in Juba and we need to be able to show the Security Council that we're able to protect the key infrastructure, the airports and the and, and uh, the, some of the missions, the warehouses and things that we have here in, in, in inside of Juba. But the real key now is to push out of Juba and push down into the, into the Equatorias and make sure that the supply routes from Uganda to Juba, um, some of the, to Tiambio, up to, from Juba to Rumbek, those, those areas are secure and stable. If we can make sure that that happens, then we have a much greater chance of South Sudan's trading routes, its economy continue, will continue to grow. Those are the issues uh, and that we need to be focusing on now that weren't a part of the way that the mandate was put together um, at the end of last year. Let's take a break from you. Okay. Welcome to Dolku Media Services. We have so many services for you, such as video production, camera hiring, sound system hiring, event management, passport photo, stand-up comedy, printing, drama, music, dance, multimedia, and photography. Dolku Media Services, our culture, our pride. Welcome back to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor. With us is the special representative of the UN Secretary General in South Sudan and ANMIS Head of Mission, His Excellency David Shira. We are talking about ANMIS mandate as an idea for the nation. Talking about RPF, it means Regional Protection Force. Mm -hmm. And yet it includes some elements outside the region, such as Bangladesh. Did this mission creep, as they say? <laughs> No, I mean, what happened was the, the main contingents are going to be uh, uh, Rwandan and Ethiopian and eventually Kenyan. 
but there were some um, specific issues like the Bangladeshis where they wanted um, particular expertise. So uh, the Bangladeshis had a, an engineering company and uh, so we have a, a Bangladeshi engineering company which is great because they're at the moment, they're, they're fixing the road between Juba and, and Ye. Uh, there's some culverts and roading there that stopped trucks getting through and lorries getting through. So. Um, they're doing their work. So I, as I said to the to President Keir the other day, I mean, because he, he raised the same issue, I said, well, Mr. President, I mean, you know, the, the, they are doing some good work for South Sudan, uh, repairing and fixing roads. So, and I think roading is one of the, the biggest issues in South Sudan. If, we, if, if, if South Sudan is going to function as an economy um, and we're going to get trade moving from, say, the Equatoria, region up to the Barra Ghazal and um, Unity State and those sorts of areas, you need roads. Um, and we're putting a big focus over the next few weeks on trying to get the roading working so that at least for six months or even seven months of the year we can have trade. Uh, trade grows the economy, the economy produces jobs ultimately that's uh, what we're going to be trying to do. What do you think it means when people raise this issue or when the president specifically raised this issue with you, what, what, what did you get from it? What do you think is the meaning of it? Uh, about, the, about riding? Uh, about about uh, having forces that are outside the region being oh, part like of the, RPF. You know, I mean, I, I often get asked this and I say, well, look, you know, the, 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 the three big battalions that are coming in are, are, are from the region, Ethiopia, um, from Rwanda and from, from Kenya. Um, but if you want to have, want to be able to get those people moving about, then you need an engineering capability. And if it's not available in the region, then you go elsewhere. It's a sim it, that's as simple as that. It's not, it's, not, it's, not a big, uh, it's not a big issue as far as I'm concerned. We want to make that work. We wanted to get the thing moving. Um, and if I could have another five engineering teams that we can use to, to, to build roads, I'd, I'd take them in a heartbeat. I think it's one of the most important things in the, uh, for the country is to, I, you know, when I, when I came here, uh, from, and I'd been here years before, um, kind of a couple of occasions, uh, what was staggered me, what surprised me most, is that you know, from, if you want to travel from Juba up to Benchu, for example, it's a two-week a two-week uh, trip, uh, and this is a thousand kilometres. It should take us, should take you, you know, three days, not two weeks, and that's because of the state of the roads. And we, and the, you know, when Su South Sudan became an independent nation, it, it really inherited very little. It was, there was very little given to it as part of its independence. Um, and that's quite apart from the conflict. The other, the other issue is its development and its infrastructure and everything else that we, that we need to get in behind. So that's a role that I think you know, the UN and UNMIS can play. Well, that is a small issue, but the big issue is well, that... Well, it's a big issue. In my, in my is opinion, I'll disagree with you. I actually think it's a big issue. There, uh, there has been tension, even confusion around uh, RPF mandate. Uh, there have been tension at the airport, especially uh, during the deployment. Has that been resolved? You talked about uh, some of the uh, key things that uh, RPF are here to discharge, like securing uh, some uh, strategic uh, facilities. So has that been resolved with the government? Um, it, it's been worked through. I mean, uh, it, it's in large part, I think it's been, it's been worked through worked out and were resolved. I mean, there's still some other issues that we're working through. We have a what we call a technical working group that's set up between our, our force military here and the, uh, and the chief of staff officer of the, uh, uh, within the SPLA. And that's been, that's been discussed about where forces are going to be deployed. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a tension that in some ways is, is, is completely understandable. On the one hand, the Security Council gives us our marching orders, what we have, what we have to do. We don't have a choice in that. That's, that's what we have been told to do. So we have to do it. At the same time, we've got the, the government, which is a sovereign government, says, well, hang on a minute. Um, we're, a, uh, you know, we're a sovereign government, and you are telling us what you have to do. And, we, and, the, and there is, in some ways, some natural tension between the, uh, between the two sides. So we have to sit down and, w and work it out. 
Um, but I think we're... Where we're, did the solution come from? Did it come from you, uh, from your interpretation of what South Sudan wants, and then reconciling what, what you are told to do and what the objective uh, conditions are? Well, I think it comes, it's, it's come from both sides. I mean, there's, there's been uh, a willingness by the SPLA and the South Sudan, Sudan government, and I've spoken at length on a number of occasions to President Salva Kiir. Um, so there's that side wanting to make it work from that side and then from our side saying, OK, what can we do to make sure that we ensure that our mandate, the main parts of our mandate are met, but at the same time it, you know, it serves the purposes that you see. And we, we just worked it through. I mean, I, you know, it's one of those things that you have to do if you're a, um, within the UN and uh, you know, working, with it, with it, working with the sovereign government. I think we're well along the well along the track. Um, I, you know, you know, I'm I'm positive and, and quite confident that we'll we'll work uh, we'll work together in the future. But these are the things that um, coming back to the mandate that you mentioned before. Some of these issues, you know, may well be raised, and there may be even be some changes in the mandate with regard to what the Security Council decides that we'll be doing in the future, given the fact that the on the ground here, things have changed. There is the overall UNMIS mandate and then there is the RPF mandate. They are not one and the same. Uh, so how do you uh, foresee this going forward? Is it going to be one mandate, one mission, one mandate, including the RPF? Or will RPF uh, stay as a standalone force with its own distinct mandate? Uh, the, uh, RPF will always be under, uh, under UNMIS. So the RPF is a, a, is, some particular, uh, is a particular reinforcement, if you like, of the UNMIS mandate. It's not going to be separate, and it's not going to be running separately. It'll be under the force commander and ultimately under me. So everything will be uh, un under, under UNMIS. It's not going to be running around and doing something different. And I think this is a real uh, misconception that people have about the, the RPF, that somehow... It's a, somehow it's a very different force. I mean, the, the Rwandan troops that are arriving uh, to make up the RPF are almost identical to the, uh, the Rwandan troops that are already here, the battalion that's already here. The Ethiopian troops that are coming in are identical to the Ethiopian troops that are already on the ground. There's no, there's no real change. It's effectively just a reinforcement of, of, of what's here, not anything particularly... Not, not, anything particularly different. Well, there is a dilemma in an event, an unlikely event, that um, RPF finds itself fighting with a force in South Sudan, say uh, the main army, then uh, the ONMIS will be part of that. It will not be left to RPF. The RPF will be ONMIS. It will be a, a, a part of ONMIS. I, I think eventually uh, um, what we'll end up doing, and I don't know when it will happen, but it'll it'll effectively can't become part of what we, the way that the forces are laid down. Like we have a sector north, a sector west, a sector south, a sector east. We may have a sector Juba or a sector central or something like that and the RPF will be merged into that. I don't, it, it can't operate as a separate uh, standalone entity. It, 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 we, it's just, it won't work inside um, what we have, the structure of UNMIS as it stands at the moment. Let's talk about uh, protection of civilians, which is, which is your main uh, mission. Yes. It has produced a phenomenon called uh, protection of civilian sites mm -hmm. around the country. How many people still remain in the POC sites around the country, and why? Uh, around about 220,000, approximately, at the moment. Um, it's in, they're, in different, they're in different places, and, and to be quite frank, the difference between Malakal and Benshu and Wau and Bora and Juba, the, the populations are quite different and, you know, different ethnic groups, different reasons for being there according to what's happening on the ground. But the ultimate, ultimately people come to us and, you know, came to hit us here in Juba, for example. We opened our gates and people came into our, literally came into our camps because they were worried and, and, and terrified that they would be that would, they would be killed or harmed, and so we set up these um, sites, these camps alongside our our uh, our bases, and people have stayed there. 
Now, what will make them go back, and we, and we would absolutely love them to go back to their homes, is security on the ground. Um, that's the biggest issue for them to, to return to their homes. The major conflict has largely subsided in Juba. Why do we still have uh, civilians living in the UN camps? In Bor, the same thing. In Malakal, the same thing. Is it turning into a permanent asylum? Um, and are you prepared for that? Uh, first of all, we, we, don't, we see these uh, sites as temporary. We don't see them as permanent. Uh, we see them as being a, a temporary measure. But what we would want to do is to have them as, as much as possible move, move back. Now, people will move back voluntarily when they feel that the conditions are right for them to, um, to, to, to move back. What we are working on is to, to say to the, the government, for example, I was in Wow. Um, just a few weeks ago, um, well, three, about three weeks ago, I said to the governor and, and, and wow, um, in some areas you're getting, you're move, people are starting to move back to their homes again because the camp, the POC camp is right, is very close to their homes. In the daytime they're going back to their homes. At the night time they're coming back to the camps. Why? Because they don't feel safe at night. The ultimate the ultimate uh, body responsible for people's so security and welfare is the government. It's not the UN. But we, are, we want to move and work with the government to help create uh, an environment where people can safely move back. And to make sure that whether it be food or uh, med uh, medical su support or education is provided outside those POC sites so that there's not an attraction or a pull to stay there from the point of view of services. But the ultimate reason people are there is for security. And the ultimate uh, responsibility, responsibility for, for security is the, is the government. Is the government, security is the main consideration, but people are even talking about economic security, that they feel that they cannot make ends meet outside the UN camp. And that uh, and this is turning it into a, a refuge center, and that is going to take uh, too long. So what are you going to do to, uh, to, to persuade some of them, if not all of them, uh, to, leave, to leave the camps? Well, first, um, as I say, the, the, the main issue is security and making sure that the, the situation is secure outside so people feel safe to go back. If they don't say feel safe, they won't go back. It's as simple as that. Second thing is, um, in Benchu, for example, we have a, uh, the, the program is called Beyond Benchu. It's about putting food, rather than people only being able to get, for example, food assistance inside a POC, now they can, they can get food assistance outside. It's making sure that medical services are outside, that school services are outside. If we don't have that balance, uh, people, uh, if they do feel secure and they do feel safe enough to be going home, but they will, won't have the services outside. We have to make sure that we support services outside as well as being inside. There's two parts to this, the security and the services. But ultimately, security is supreme. It's the most important part of the. Do you think they will ever be closed, the POC sites? Is there a timeline? That's my ultimate aim. They've been, they've been decreasing um, gradually over the last few months. So we've had a a decrease in the numbers. Um, in Benchu, for example, where there's the biggest uh, uh, site, which is uh, about 115,000 people there, uh, we've had 30, more than 30,000 people leave. Um, unfortunately, another 30,000 people from an other areas have moved in because there's been fighting in the areas and they've fled to a place where they think they can be safe. We need to see safety and security across all of the area of unity. And that is a perpetual unity. project. It's, what, it's, a, what, the it's a perpetual project. Well, we, we would hope that it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, an open-ended project where people can move, up, move out and be, and be safe. I do not want, as, as myself, I do not want to be in you know, two or three or five years' time looking back and saying, there's still POC camps. I want those people to be going home and leading normal lives and that kids are growing up in their own homes, that they're able to grow their own food, that they're able to get jobs that can go to their local school. That's, what, that's my 
that's my vision of what I would like to see in the next two or three years. Going back to the impact of the mandate and the, the, this idea of fixing this nation, of fixing South Sudan, I would like to bring this quotation that you said recently in your uh, press release. And you said this, we are not looking at the mandate uh, not being renewed at the moment. There is no plan B. There is only plan A. That the mandate will be renewed. So, inshallah, I hope it is and we are able to continue as we are. If it does not, then we will frantically start planning. So, there is no exit strategy <laughs> um, for the UN to leave the Republic of South Sudan. I, n no, I think the, the fact that the, re the mandate is renewed every year means that what we, are have, what we have to do is reflect on what we're doing here every single year. So it's not like we, you know, um, continue on. But what I was saying there was that we, that, uh, we need to look at the, the conditions that are on the ground here and how we can best suit the conditions. I've also said uh, in many of my speeches that, and, uh, was that my greatest wish is that I will be made redundant here and I will lose my job. Uh, and that I have to leave South Sudan because there's no need for UNMIS to be here anymore. And that would be my greatest, uh, greatest uh, thrill to be able to, to do that. What will it take for UNMIS to disband, to use that word? Um, peace in South Sudan, where we, we don't need uh, to protect people uh, and we don't need to be on the ground patrolling roads or making places safe. If that comes, and I, I sincerely hope that it comes soon, uh, that we, we will be ready to leave. We've left in, uh, Co Co in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, we've left in, uh, in East Timor, we've left recently in Haiti, uh, in, uh, in Liberia. Uh, my, and I, I worked in uh, some of those places in the past, and it gives me great joy to see that you know, the UN is in a peacekeeping capacity is no longer needed there. I'd like to see South Sudan in exactly the same place where we're not needed here and that South Sudan's military are part of a peacekeeping mission in another country saying we know about conflict and we want to be able to help other countries um, move through conflict as well. David Shara, thanks for being on Fixing South Sudan. Madin, thank you very much. Nice thank to be you. with you. Thank you. And that is Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. If it is Thursday, it's Fixing South Sudan with me, Madingor.